Dr. A.V. Balasubramaniam. And although he's a popular figure, but decorum demands that for the benefit of students, I introduce the speaker to them. Dr. Balasubramaniam obtained his MSc degree in chemistry from Bangalore University and did a post MSc diploma in molecular biophysics from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Later, he studied physiology and biophysics at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Since the year 1982, he has been involved in work relating to various aspects of traditional Indian sciences and technologies and trying to explore their current relevance and potential. In the year 1995, he founded the Center for Indian Knowledge System, CIKS, an institution devoted to exploring the contemporary relevance and applications of Indian knowledge systems, particularly in the area of sustainable agriculture. In CIKS, he has been involved in the production of educational and training material on various aspects of sustainable agriculture, as well as research on this topic, drawing upon indigenous knowledge system and practices. More recently, he has also been involved in helping farmers to set up a large number of producer companies through which various activities relating to the production and marketing of organic produce are carried out, as well as services for farmers are offered. He has been a member of several committees of the Government of India, Ministry of Science and Technology, Ministry of Rural Development, and Ministry of Human Resources Development, the erstwhile Ministry of Human Resources and Development, which is today Ministry of Education, as well as on the editorial board of several magazines and journals, to name a few, Journal of, the Ayurveda, <coughs> Journal of Ayurveda and Integrative Medicine. Besides agriculture, he also has an active interest in other areas of Indian knowledge systems, including indigenous health and yoga, as well as the epistemology of traditional knowledge systems. For his contributions in the area of indigenous traditions of sciences and technologies, he was the recipient of an honorary doctorate awarded by the Gandhigram Rural University, Gandhigram, in Dindukal district of Tamil Nadu in 2010. Currently, he is the director of the Center for Indian Knowledge Systems, which is based in Chennai. Today, especially in the past few years, we see a lot of resurgence on topics related to Indian knowledge system. And it is particularly thanks to um, Jambavans like Professor Balasubramaniam that today we are able to reap the benefits of the works that and the efforts that these people have put in. And I'm particularly honored to have him as a speaker today, who is going to talk to us on a very interesting topic, which he has titled as the nature and social organization <clears throat> of traditional knowledge an introduction for students of modern science and technology. With these words of introduction, I request Dr. Balasubramaniam to start his lecture. Over to you, sir. I also request the participants to please mute your mic. Uh, whatever questions that you may have, kindly, uh, there'll be opportunity for you to raise your hand and ask towards the end of the lecture, or you may even type it. And, but I, my uh, humble request is to keep your mics in the mute mode when the lecture is on. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Ramnathan. It's a great uh, privilege and honor to be invited to speak in a forum like this, which represents, as it were, interestingly enough, the two aspects that I'm talking about. The Indian Institute of Technology at Varanasi is a representation of one of the best expressions of institutions of research and training on modern science and technology. The place where it's located, Varanasi itself, really is perhaps uh, representative of high scholarship and practice as far as India is concerned for traditional knowledge systems. Almost anyone who claims to speak for tradition or traditional knowledge system had to prove himself in Banaras. That's been the history of our knowledge systems for 30 centuries or more. So I deem it a great honor to have this opportunity to make this presentation at the IAT at Banaras Indian University. May I have the first slide of the presentation, please? I request uh, the presenter to share the PowerPoint that I prepared for the occasion. 
Vinisha, can you please pull up the PowerPoint? Yes, sir. Sir, is it visible now? Yeah, it's visible to me. Maybe I yeah. should ask. Uh, yeah, it is visible to me. It is visible okay. to Yes, all. yes, it is visible, okay. sir. Thank you. Okay, sir. So I titled my talk as The Nature and Social Organization of Traditional Knowledge, an Introduction for Students of Modern Science and Technology. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the outline of the talk is I'll start the background, then I'll go on to say something about the social organization of traditional knowledge and then the content of traditional knowledge and get into this aspect relating to testing and validation and then look at some key contrast between traditional and modern approaches and finally say something about implications of all this for the present. Next slide please. Now we can start with a valid question. Is there anything separate or specific as traditional system of science and technology? One may say all knowledge can be tested or validated. I'm sorry, one of this uh, bars here is partly masking my slide. Is there any way in which you could make an adjustment? May I request? I'm not able to read part of my slide because it's marked by this uh, control bar which shows the camera and uh, you know mic and all that. Actually, if you move your cursor, that bar, that bar will disappear. I'll move my, should move my, I mean cursor. drag the bar away? Yeah, uh, no, not drag the bar away. You can just ah. move the cursor somewhere else and click on somewhere else and then the bar will disappear by itself. Oh, Only when there is a subsequent movement of the cursor, the bar will reappear. Otherwise, the bar should disappear. Okay, okay, fine. So one may say all knowledge can be tested, validated by modern scientific approach because it's universal. Next slide, please. So what I'll try to do in this presentation is I'll try and address some of the key issues looking at aspects like the social organization of knowledge. What is the content of traditional knowledge? The issue of testing and validation and certain key contrast between traditional and modern knowledge. I'm Going into this in detail because I'm assuming that a very large number of participants in this really have training and background in modern knowledge systems and very little formal training or background in traditional knowledge systems. Though all of us, as we are brought up in India, have a certain feel or understanding of various aspects of it. Lastly, I'd say that uh, this is merely to provide a bird's eye view to the subject. And there's really a lot more to be looked at if one is interested. Next slide, please. So we'll start with the social organization of traditional knowledge. Next slide, please. So I would start with the example of traditional medicine or healthcare system. It offers a good illustration because of its widespread use, familiarity, and huge corpus of literature and body of knowledge. Next slide. So traditional medicine really operates at two different levels. If we're looking at social organization, one is what you would call as the Shastriya Parampara, the classical traditional knowledge. Second is what you'd call as Lok Parampara, the folk tradition of knowledge. Next. By classical tradition, I mean, we have institutionally trained practitioners of so the Ayurveda, Siddha and Yunani system. We have well-developed and clearly spelt out theory of medical science. There are also a large number of texts and manuscripts. Next slide, please. By the folk stream of the Lok Parampara, there are several examples I given. There are folk and tribal practitioners in various parts of India known variously by names like Vaidu, Vaidyar, or Bhagat. There are families specializing in the treatment of specific diseases in many parts of India. It could be jaundice or asthma. There's household knowledge of simple remedies for common ailments. There are proverbs and folk sayings related to health. 
there are preventive and promotive methods relating to yoga and martial arts these are not medical traditions per se but i have a medical aspect to it there are specialty areas like bone setting or dentistry then there is a whole tribe of traditional birth attendants or dais who till very recently really accounted for a very large number of child births in india next slide now what is the relationship between folk and classical how do i even consider them to be two aspects of the same parampara or tradition first of all there is a commonality of underlying theory and world view both the lok parampara and shastri parampara builds on panchama bhut siddhant and trijosh theory there are commonality of technical terms like vata pitta kapha ushna and shita a village vaidya who may be unlettered will make a diagnosis based on aggravation of a dosha like vata or pitta or he may say that something has heated up the body quite a bit it leads to ushna and so on at a more fundamental level there is also a commonality of pramana or means of validation that are used by both traditions next slide do the shastras recognize or respect folk knowledge interestingly enough if we look at a classic text of ayurveda like charaka samhita there is a beautiful saying aushadi nama rupabhyam janate khyajapavane avipaschayeva gopascha ye chaniye vanavasinaha the goat herd shepherds cow herds and other forest dwellers know the drugs by name and form this is the respectful way in which the ayurvedic classic charaka samhita refers to folk knowledge that is there of traditional medicine among these categories of people next slide there is a very similar quotation also from sushruta samhita gopala tapas vyadha yechanye vanacharinah mula jati hi chatebhyo beshadak vyakti ishyate one can know about drugs from cowherds tapasvis hunters and those who live in forest and those who live by eating roots and tubers next slide <clears throat> now if you come down to about 20 years back in around 1994 the government of india conducted what they call as an all india coordinated research project in ethnobiology i'm sorry the i think the characters are a little small you can't see it clearly but basically this is to convey that even as late as this when they looked at the knowledge of the use of medicinal plants by just the tribal communities of india they constitute about 7% of the population a huge number something like over 7500 plants were being used by tribals for a variety of purposes this shows how live and active the lok parampara or the folk tradition still is even down to our era next slide please no ayurvedic knowledge is embedded also in various of our traditions just to give you an example as per ayurvedic understanding our digestive power is maximum in winter and minimum in summer in other words according to ayurveda there is a stimulus response relationship between the agni that's outside the sun and agni that's within us the digestive fire when the agni that's outside the sun is most powerful in the height of winter our digestive power is at the minimum level and conversely in summer i mean in summer it's at a minimum level and winter it's at a maximum level let's see how this kind of knowledge gets embedded in our traditional practices next slide please i'm quoting an interesting example that i have learned from my guru yogi krishnamacharya he used to say look at a festival like ramanavami which comes in the height of summer what you use as prasadam or the dish of choice for ramanavami is near more diluted buttermilk and panakam they are very really light digestive appetizers whereas in something like krishna jayanti which comes in the height of winter or deepavali that was just passed you can really afford to take things that are very sweet very heavy to digest in moderate quantities of course so the interesting thing is if we look at the way in which we adapt our customs our food and our behavior to various seasons there is knowledge and understanding of ayurveda that's embedded in this 
this is just to show how folk knowledge is something that's so pervasive. Next slide, please. Now, such folk and classical traditions are not just in Ayurveda, but you find them apart from medicine, you find them in grammar, you find them in arithmetic, you find them in language, you find them in music. This is a very pervasive aspect of Indian knowledge systems in general. Next slide, please. Next slide. Now, I want to take one particular branch of traditional knowledge, namely Vrikshayarveda, and explore what we know about the content and various aspects of it. Next slide. What is Vrikshayarveda? Ayurveda is generally what's called as the science of life. Mriga Ayurveda is Ayurveda for animals. And Vriksha Ayurveda is Ayurveda for plants and trees. This is a bit unusual. So I want to go into it to give people an idea as to what this Vriksha Ayurveda is about as a branch of traditional knowledge. Next slide. Next slide, please. Vriksha Ayurveda is mentioned among the 64 arts and various ancient texts. Next slide. I am wondering, is it possible to enable me to share this? Yeah, of course. Um, Would that be quicker? I think so. Um, you can just present it from your end. Okay. But then let me just see if I can go to, I had to go to share screen, is it here? Yes. Is it open share tray? Uh, no. Yes, open share tray, yes. Okay. okay. Screen share. No, I think it's your screen that's popping up. No, if you, if you already keep the PowerPoint open and in the present, uh, not in the presentation mode, but in normal PowerPoint file being open and then you can share the screen. Let me just see. Okay, are you able to, one second. I'm sorry to make this switch, but I thought I may want to skip a few slides in between and so that would be more convenient for me to do. Okay. I'm trying to click the share, but uh, entire screen. Are you facing are you, any trouble in that? Are you able to see the screen now? Not yet. Okay. No. Okay, fine. Maybe I shouldn't try to switch horses halfway through. Let's go back to this. I just thought that may help me to skip some slides because to keep to time. But anyway, fine. Okay. Sorry about that. Let's get back to you sharing by your uh, colleague. Yeah, Vinisha, please go ahead. Uh, sorry. Okay, sir. Sorry about that. Is it visible, sir? Yeah, I can. It's yeah. visible. Can it's, get uh, to, go to yeah, the, this is the first slide. slide. Get on to some 20 or so slides. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So here also there are two traditions, the Shastri Parampara and the folk literature. Next slide. Sorry. Yeah, so classical literature consists of texts or manuscripts published as books. And as before, they have clearly spelled out theoretical framework. Fundamental principles are drawn from Ayurveda. Next slide. So these may be of various kinds. They may be Puranas or Samhitas. They may be general texts or they may be specific Vrikshayarada texts. Next slide. 
can you skip two three more slides go ahead next next ah so i have just scored one slide before please one more slide before yeah so actually if you come to the classical texts there are various sanskrit texts like rikshayaveda of surapala kashyapi krishi sukti of sait kashipa upavana vinoda of sarangadara and so on next slide there are also texts in various indian languages like lokopakara in kannada krishi geetha in malayalam and so on next one now what is the scope of rikshayaveda what are the things that texts of rikshayaveda talk about they talk about collection selection and storage of seeds germination and sowing various techniques of plant propagation grafting nursing and irrigation testing and classification of soil and selection of plants to suit various soil types next slide they also talk about manuring pest and disease management nomenclature and taxonomy description and classification of plants to suit varied purposes favorable and unfavorable meteorological conditions for agricultural operations plants as indicators of weather water and minerals and also botanical marvels so you can see there's a very wide range of these things that rikshayar the text talk about next slide so what is the rikshayar the approach it talks about plants and health promotion of good health and growth it also talk about treatment of pests diseases and injuries next slide so here we know that uh, diseases in plants may be endogenous like they may be affected by vata pitta and kapha like human being or exogenous like diseases due to fire injuries or lightning next slide skip the next two or three slides please go on ha huh. here i am giving examples of various kinds of folk literature or lok parampara of rikshayaveda next slide for example asian agri history is a journal that publishes a very large collection of papers and folk knowledge relating to rikshayaveda next slide <clears throat> next slide indian journal of traditional knowledge also publishes a whole lot of material relating to traditional knowledge and agriculture next slide next slide so next slide one key question that is often faced when we talk about traditional knowledge is a variety of practices have been listed in shastric literature as well as folk literature have they been subject to testing or validation who has done such testing where and when because quite often we say all sorts of things are done but how do we know if something is valid here interestingly enough there has been a major exercise that's been taken up which i'll describe to you next slide <clears throat> there was a major effort that was taken up by the indian council of agricultural research there have also been efforts by agencies like centre for indian knowledge systems which is my parent agency and efforts by other scientists next slide next slide see between the years 2002 and 2004 indian council of agricultural research took up a detailed documentation and compilation of traditional practices relating to agriculture they published a total of 7 volumes including one volume on documentation and validation where they have listed more than 4000 odd practices next slide these are some of the volumes that were published by them next slide these practices were classified in detail thematically like in this volume you see practices relating to rain water management methods to check soil and water erosion crops and cropping system pest and disease management and so on next slide okay these are just tells you detail about how this testing and validation was undertaken skip the next two slides please go on a bit quick next 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 ha ah. 
Now we did a meta analysis of these results and we found something very interesting. The ICR has put to test 111 such practices. And interestingly enough, our analysis shows that of these 111 practices, 95, that is 85, nearly 86% of them have proved to be valid. Three of them, namely about 3% of them have proved to be partly valid. Two of them have to be repeated. And according to ICR, 10 of them are not valid. Even if you set aside the 10 that are not valid, what comes across very interestingly is that nearly 89 to 90% of these practices are tested and validated by modern scientific methods, by tests taken up in agricultural universities, Krishi Vigyan Kendra, state agricultural laboratories, and so on. Next one. Next one. Similarly, a lot of efforts have been made by CIKs to look at practices relating to pest control, disease control, and so on. Next slide. Big question is, why are we not using these tested and validated technologies? The answer is sadly that they remain practically unknown. Even this information about these volumes that I shared with you had to be coaxed out of ICR by filing an RTI right to information petition. Next slide. Sorry, if you look at a close up of this about 12 years back, I heard about these volumes, but I was not able to lay my hands on any of these volumes. Finally, I had to file a right to information petition to ICR. And then they had to say that, yes, we have published these volumes are available. This is what is available and all that to get the volumes out. So unfortunately, these practices, even though they are tested and validated, remain practically unknown. That's one of the great tragedies of traditional knowledge. Next slide. <clears throat> Now, I want to now come to certain key contrasts between traditional and modern approaches to knowledge testing and validation. Next slide. Now, one, some of the key points in which there are contrasts are in any scientific endeavor or knowledge system, they have to answer questions as to how do we achieve rigor? What are the means and methods for quantification? What are the methods used to construct theories? And what is it that are considered as trustworthy or untrustworthy approaches? Next slide. Now, when we try to achieve rigor, measurement, quantification, and mathematical techniques are the preferred approaches that are used in the West. Whereas in India, traditionally, the approach has been the use of natural language itself. Prakrit, that is natural language, which has undergone refinement, becomes Sanskrit. And the refined natural language itself is used for technical discourses and discussions. Next slide. For example, in the West, it's considered, if you say what is the supreme example of a rigorous scientific theory in the Greco-Roman tradition, we would perhaps say that it is the elements of Euclid. In the Indian knowledge system, a similar place of honor is assigned to two texts, Ashtadhyayi of Panini, <coughs> the Sanskrit grammar is considered to be the supreme example of a theoretical construct. In fact, there is an ancient saying in Sanskrit, kanadam paniniyam cha sarvashastropakarakam, literally meaning that the logic of kanada and the grammar of panini are required and essential for the study of each of the shastras. So here the approach is to use natural language Sanskrit itself and not resort in every case to mathematical techniques. Next slide. <coughs> Western sciences use units that are universal or external to specific context. For example, if you say that some object weighs 60 kilograms, it means it weighs 60 times as much as a kilogram, which is an arbitrary external standard of weight that's universally agreed upon. Whereas traditional sciences tend to use units that are normalized to the context of the person. For example, if you are talking about the height of a person or some body part, they express it in terms of anguli, which is a measure of length or the width of a finger. Anjali is a measure of volume <coughs> that's normalized to a person. This has been the traditional approach. Next slide. You can skip the next two or three slides. Go on. 
Yeah. <clears throat> Here I'd like to talk about one other very interesting contrast between the types of parameters that are used by traditional knowledge and modern knowledge. Modern knowledge uses categories that need continuous revision, evolution, and elaboration. The categories used by Ayurveda and traditional knowledge tend to be what they call as nitya, which are theories which are relatively constant and unchanging. I'd like to share a very interesting example from the next slide. Yeah. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Here I have rendered it in the form of a cartoon. About a century back, Captain Srinivasamurthy, who was a modern physician, took to a serious study of Ayurveda and traditional knowledge because he was a member secretary of what was called as the Usman Committee to look at traditional knowledge. At that time, he was struck by the <clears throat> difference that is used by these two methods, which I have explained with a cartoon. Supposing you were to look at a list of all the nationalities or all the people who have tried to conquer India and marched into India, there can be two ways. You can make a list saying that the Greeks came and then the Arabs came and then the Dutch came and then the English came. Various lists like that. In future, if someone else comes, you have to go on adding to the list. There is a different approach you can use. You can say that we are classifying it as people who came through land, people who came through water, and people who came through air, or combinations of these. He said that when Ayurvedic people say that we look at the causation of disease and say, what is the dosha that's affected? Is it vata, is it pitta, or is it kapha? There is a timelessness and universality about <clears throat> changelessness about this category. It can accommodate symptom complex not only for the previously known diseases but even any new disease. For example, let's say Sai Vaidya has to treat someone who is affected by COVID. You may say, look, a, where a clinical phenomenon like COVID is really not known to Ayurveda. How can you treat a patient who is suffering from COVID? The Ayurvedic physician's answer is quite simple. Let me examine the patient. Let me look at a symptom complex. Let me ask him questions. And based on which I would know what dosha he is suffering from. Now, this is a very interesting thing because quite often we tend to think that categories of uh, Ayurveda, categories of traditional knowledge are frozen in time. They are not developed. What we need to understand is that they use different kinds of categories to look at change and look at <clears throat> phenomena. This is an example that shows you what kind of categories are used. Next slide. Quite often in traditional knowledge, we look at parameters and we look at things and say, Ayurveda will say something as such and such a smell, something as such and such a taste. And so it may have these properties. Now, this is something always troubling and a bit puzzling to a student of modern science. Because in modern science, things like smell and taste are not considered as trustworthy parameters with which you do your theories. We need to go a little bit deeper into the background of Western science to comprehend this difference. Can I have the next slide, please? Aristotle made a fundamental distinction between trustworthy qualities and untrustworthy qualities. This distinction is quite deep and I'd like you people to pay close attention and to grasp this. He says it took it something like smell, color or taste. It can be grasped only through one sense organ. By which he means, supposing you say that an apple is red in color, you can see that it is red. But you cannot verify its redness by tasting it or by touching it. <clears throat> Whereas the other thing, if you look at number or size, you can see in front of you that there are two apples. You can touch and sense there are two apples. There are other parameters that you can grasp through more than one sense organ. So Aristotle made this distinction and he said that theories can be made only through 
essential sensibilia and not through things like smell, color or taste. Next slide. Next slide, please. Now, we need to understand that uh, in India, the approach is something that is entirely different. People admitted that there are objects that can be acquired through two sense organs, like number or magnitude. There are those that can be acquired only through one sense organ, like color or taste. In fact, our people went on to say that there are those that can be acquired only through internal sense organs, like the manas, cognition, Ichha and Dvesha, desire and aversion. This is the framework that is given as Padartha Sam, Sara Samgraha of Prashasta Pada. Next slide. So the approach that was taken traditionally in India is error and falsehood regarding knowledge of qualities is important, needs to be understood. Truthfulness of knowledge is understood independently and not in relation to the basic sensory mode. Just because something is acquired through one sense organ or two sense organ, it doesn't necessarily make it truthful or untruthful was the position. Next slide. I'm going through this because quite often when Ayurveda says that something has a sweet taste, something has a bitter taste, so some property follows. People like many of us or like me whose basic training is in chemistry or biochemistry tend to be suspicious and say, how can that be? This doesn't sound right. So here the answer to that is, the traditional approach is different. CA case has in fact used taste of various plants or rasa to look for new biopesticides. Next slide. So can traditional knowledge be tested using modern scientific methodologies? Yes, we have experiences to share. This approach can have some limitations and pitfalls. Next slide. For example, quite often in traditional knowledge, we talk about foods or substances being Ushna or Sita, hot or cold. So in 1969, in National Institute of Nutrition, there was a scientist who said, let's me put this to experimental test. Next slide. So he chose 10 normal healthy adults. He put them for 10 days on hot foods, followed by 10 days on cold foods. And he adjusted the protein calorie values so that they were equivalent irrespective whether it was hot foods or cold foods. Next slide. <clears throat> the first seven days was a period of adjustment and then for the next three days he made measurements. What he found was subjects on hot foods had urine with much higher acidity. <coughs> they complained of burning sensation during maturation and burning sensation in the eyes. Subjects on cold foods had no such discomfort. And he also observed some differences in fecal nitrogen excretion and so on. Next slide. This is interesting because this appears to be a study where he used modern scientific methodology <clears throat> to look at really what difference hot and cold foods make in terms of what he can measure and observe. Next slide, please. However, testing and validation using other methods may have some limitations. The two approaches may be overlapping but not identical. <clears throat> or two approaches may be non-commensurate and I'll cite examples. Next slide. For example, anemia in modern medicine is measured in terms of levels of iron or hemoglobin in the blood. Is there an exact equivalent for that in traditional medicine or Ayurveda? No. People talk about a phenomenon called Panduroga. It's a symptom complex that overlaps with anemia, but it's not exactly equivalent to anemia. So it's difficult to look at treatment for anemia from the point of view what Ayurveda does for Panduroga. You know? There is a problem of definition and overlap. Next slide. There is a way... <clears throat> There are also many cases where the two approaches may be non-commensurate, by means by which I mean one cannot be measured against the other. For example, you look at morning sickness in modern medicine and how it is looked at as Dauhridyam in Ayurveda. Next slide. Morning sickness, that's a kind of nausea and sickness that may some women experience during the first or early stages of pregnancy leading to vomiting, leading to certain types of behavioral 
kinds of uh, problems. In modern medicine, it's attributed to levels of certain hormones such as estrogen, HCG, hypoglycemia, and so on. How does traditional medicine look at it? Next slide. The traditional name for a pregnant woman is Dauhridi, which is very interesting. Hridaya is not just the heart, which is the pump that circulates the blood, but Hridaya is considered also the seat of emotion. Dauhridi literally means she who is endowed with two Hridayas or two seats of emotion. She has two different seats and quite often we see <clears throat> pregnant women experience certain emotions that are quite different from what they experience during the non-pregnant or quote-unquote normal status. Sometimes they have intense liking for something which they didn't like earlier or the other way. So Ayurveda's understanding is that there are two seats of emotion in her. This is a very different approach which is non-commensurate with the morning sickness approach as you can see. Next slide. So what is interesting is that this is not just a philosophical position. If you look at how Dauhridhyam is approached in Ayurveda, there are guidelines for diet and lifestyle that can be very useful. Even medication is possible. So this is just to tell you how two different approaches there are. Next slide. What are the implications for today and what are the conclusions? Next slide. We what if some traditional knowledge of practice has not been subject to what we call as modern scientific testing? I declare that we cannot conclude just because it's not been subjected to modern scientific testing, we cannot conclude that such knowledge is not valid. In fact, I'd like to cite this saying, absence of evidence for efficacy is not the same thing as evidence for absence of efficacy. <clears throat> I'll repeat this. Absence of evidence for efficacy is not the same thing as evidence for absence of efficacy. Next slide. Folk traditions are still vibrant in many areas. There are innovations of various kinds. There are new uses for old materials. There are uses for newer materials, including synthetic materials. Next slide. There are many examples that can be cited, but I'll just give one. About 30 years back, the forest department in Maharashtra, they started encouraging the planting of an exotic species called Casia auriculoformis, which really is from Australia. And then it was found that within two years of that plant being used in tribal areas of Maharashtra, the Warli tribals were using it as fish poison <coughs> to hunt and harvest fish. This is very interesting because such a use for this plant is not known in modern science. It's not also known in Australia, which is the place of origin of this plant, which leaves us with a very interesting question. What is the kind of testing or observation that the tribal do based on which they came to a conclusion that this is a usable as a fish poison and used it effectively? Next slide. Now, concluding, I'll just have a few more slides. What is our take on traditional knowledge and its value today? Currently, there are a few prominent streams of opinion which we'll describe. We'll follow this with our understanding of traditional knowledge and its value today. Next slide. I'd say that there are about... Professor Ramnathan, can I take 10 more minutes? Yeah, of course, by all means. Thank uh, you. We have, we have sufficient time, yes. Thank you. I'd say that there are three broad uh, types of attitude which are around quite a bit. One I would call as total dismissal. Another is to claim that we had everything. And the third is to say that <clears throat> it is no longer of any use. Next slide. A total dismissal is a position where people seem to feel that traditional knowledge has no value now. It had no value even then and that we did not ever have anything in the nature of knowledge or science. This is something which we totally reject or I totally reject. I feel there is a whole lot of evidence to the contrary. It cannot be subject to total dismissal. Next slide. Another extreme position is to say we had everything. There are people who would say our ancients had all the knowledge and technologies. They had known or anticipated all modern developments. 
they would say we had aircraft we had atomic weapons we had space travel this is also something which to me is certainly not acceptable at all i don't think the evidence that we have or had ever justify the claim to the effect that we had everything and we had known everything no next slide there is a third view which one can say that people feel that it's no longer relevant what do they mean by that they may say admit that at one time this knowledge was or may have been relevant but they go on to say that it is no longer relevant the times have changed the situation has changed modern developments have subsumed and included everything of value in tradition this is also a position that i reject i think uh, we reject the position that it is no longer relevant there are very many areas where it continues to be relevant in the past in the current and it will be in the future it's not true that modern developments have subsumed or included everything of value in tradition next slide so in a positive sense if i have to spell out what is our understanding of traditional knowledge today let me just do it in the last two or three slides next slide next slide please first let me start out by an understanding of what i think traditional knowledge is not it is not an underdeveloped form of modern knowledge or technology it's not a second rate option that we can provide to those who cannot afford modern solutions it is not a stop gap arrangement that we put in place till we can find modern solutions in any sector or area so i would say this is not what is traditional knowledge as i understand it next slide in a positive sense if i have to say what traditional knowledge is what would i say it arises from a specific viewpoint world view or a line of thinking it has its own areas of strength where it can contribute handsomely it has solutions that are time tested and location specific it is capable of providing answers where modernity may have none it may in some cases it may have nothing to offer that can be of use at least immediately it may mean that we may have to build on it may have to reflect on it before it has something to offer it may not have anything to offer in every single area and lastly next slide in fact i'd like to conclude with this very beautiful shloka from the classic sanskrit play malavika agnimitra for those who are not familiar with the tradition the tradition in sanskrit play is that whenever a play is performed this person called sutradhar introduces the play to the audience and seeks their permission saying that i am going to present a play it is composed by such and such poet and i am going to present it appears that when kalidasa's play malavika agnimitra was first to be presented someone who objected saying that what is the need for a play from a new playwright like kalidasa and there are so many classic scholars who are still around and i'll read this shloka it has a very beautiful flavor in sanskrit and followed by the translation in english purana mitteva nasadu sarvam nachapi kavyam navamitevadhyam santa parichyana tara bhajante mudaha parapratiyane buddhihi not everything is to be accepted as good merely because it is old nor is something to be rejected only because it is new the wise make a decision after they examine the specific details in each case it is the fool who may get carried away by such general labels and descriptions so i think that's a very beautiful sentiment that comes from a as a voice from my tradition so i conclude by quoting from this example from kalidasa's malavika agnimitra so thank you for this opportunity and your patient hearing as i said in some of these areas there is a whole world that needs to be explored further and i hope i have succeeded in creating some amount of interest and curiosity among some of you to look deeper into this subject i'll conclude my presentation thank you now i hand it over to the organizers for and i'm happy to listen to any comments or take any questions thank you thank you dr bala subramanian for that wonderful lecture now the floor is open for discussion so if 
any of my participants have anything to ask or to comment, I request that you please unmute yourself and introduce yourself very briefly and then go ahead with your question. If you can raise your hand, I can call out the name. Otherwise, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, Pavan, please go ahead. <clears throat> Pavan, are you able to unmute yourself? I see Mr. Pavan is still muted. Okay, he's just unmuted. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, yeah, please. Oh, yes, okay. Th thank you, Dr. Uh, Balasalamanyu. I am Pavan from Physics Department. Uh, a very nice, in interesting talk. Uh, uh, so uh, I have uh, actually a lot of questions if uh, Ramadan can entertain, but I will go through a uh, few at least. So uh, the one that you mentioned very early on regarding the Shastra Parampara and the Lok Parampara, uh, you quoted, I, I happened to hear a talk uh, which also opened with the same, uh, which had the same opening, but they put it in the opposite sense, such that the Shastras, uh, whatever knowledge is there in the Shastras, it has been gained from the Gopabalas or the Vanavasis, and somehow it is uh, being written in, into a uh, text, so to say, uh, the Shastra as we understand, <laughs> that somehow became a little uh, superior and somehow uh, uh, and then they attribute it to the Ashwinis. So when you and that is how, and that is, I, I'm not sure if the question came across clearly. Did it? The text to say that uh, the the knowledge came from Ashwinis, but then eventually they go on to say that you have to talk to the Gopabalas or the Vanvasis or the and to get to gain some knowledge, but. The way you put it was a synchro, was a harmony sort of a thing between theorization and then uh, from hand, hand, hands on knowledge. Yeah, let me put but it this way. Put it the other way around, that. saying that they actually appropriate the knowledge from the tribals and then somehow give it uh, in the as a shastra, it becomes something superior to that. No, I put it this way that. Uh... There is a role for the Lok Parampara. There is a Lok for the Shastrakara. For example, uh, I do not know how uh, by taking a bit of knowledge and refining it and putting it to practical use, we are not depriving the people of the knowledge in any way. We are only, in fact, in every single case, when something like Charaka Samhita or Sushrit Samhita says that these are the properties of some of the herbs, they say that we are giving some illustrations and examples. Lots more are there. You can go to the world and learn it. In fact, very interestingly, if you look at something like Panini Sashtadhyayi, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Mahabhashyam, which is Patanjali's commentary on Panini Sashtadhyayi, they have a beautiful analogy to explain the difference between, explain the relationship between theory and practice. They say, supposing you want to make a pot, you go to a potter and give him some mm. money or pot substance and say, I want to use a pot, please make a pot for me. Whereas if you have subject to new feelings, nobody rushes to a grammarian and says, I have new feelings, please coin a new word. Okay. Where does it get coined? In the loka, in the world, in the context of use. So everywhere we see a symbiotic relationship just by saying that it is given by Ashwini Devitas, it is not taking away any credit. There is a role played by people who are systematizing it and people who are making uh, <clears throat> theories in the sense, even in the Tamil grammar that is uh, There is a very interesting discussion between two grammarians or two poets, Kamban and Ottakutan. When Ottakutan uses a particular word, Kamban says this word that you use is not there in any of our Nigantus or any of our dictionaries. And Ottakutan says it is there in people's practice. And one day when he walks along in a cherry is what they say. He sees a group of women who are churning buttermilk and they use that word called need to me. And he says it's there in use amongst our people. And that is the ultimate justification of what is grammatical or not grammatical. I feel that if you are using resources 
of medicinal plants in a very exploitative way and depriving the locals of it, then you are appropriating it for that. To say that uh, Ashwini Devitas gave it is a form of systematizing, even if you ask the tribal themselves, they would say that we got it from our great spirit, we got it from our ancestors, we got it from our, uh, you know, our own gods and goddesses. That doesn't yes, take yes. away any credit from them. This is a larger uh, question to discuss, but there's a brief answer to that. Yeah. Yeah, Everywhere so I think is what... there is a symbiosis between folk and traditional knowledge. I'm not saying that things are perfect. There would have been a deterioration. There might have been distortions of it, but this is what I understand is the traditional practice. Uh, this arises uh, partly because of our history in the social history where some yeah. were marginalized. So the person presenting was some rationalist thought of the person. So he took this perspective to juxtapose rather than harmonize the both. Uh, so, and then uh, regarding the methods and testing validation using the so-called modern and the traditional uh, um, ways of doing things. Uh, so, there is this uh, also normalization of the uh, uh, medicine, med, um, med treatment to the individual like Nadi, even Jyotisha also plays a role uh, and then height, profession, etc. So, these are not there in the... Uh, uh, modern uh, allopathy sort of uh, allopathy medicine. So, uh, how can we even uh, start a conversation when there is a dismissal? I think there was also a, uh, I mean, of course, Ayush includes uh, uh, homeopathy, but uh, this uh, I, I remember from uh, Royal British uh, Medical Society, uh, they it was dismissed as some sort of a limbo. So I don't know your opinion on a homeopathy, but uh, so if this is the sort of an attitude, then how can how can we have a conversation with the traditional knowledge systems and modern science, <coughs> so to say? What See, let things? us just define what is our objective. Our objective is to promote among people or among audience good health and treatment of disease. What are the approaches that it can do? We need not decry the outstanding successes that have been achieved by certain modern techniques. For example, for communicable diseases, the use of certain types of medications. But modern medicine is also now discovering that there is a heterogeneity. Not all people respond exactly to the same medication in the same way. Ayurveda says, yes, there is a difference of prakriti in any population of individuals that may make a difference. That's one aspect of it. So they say, can we tune it in any way and make the medicine individualized? So yes. there are ways in which these factors can also come in. So if our objective is to say, and modern medicine is also discovering that for lifestyle related diseases or certain organic disorders, the approach that works so successfully for communicable diseases is not so effective. So if our focus is how do we deliver good health, preventive and promoting to our people, we can know how to make use of modern medicine also and also traditional medicine. We need not see them in antagonistic relationship. In fact, if you see the way in which the Ayurvedic pharmacopoeia has evolved through the centuries, there are things like potato, there are things like tobacco, there are things like red chilies, which are not native to India and came in a few centuries back. They have got incorporated in the Ayurvedic pharmacopoeia and people have started using them. I see no particular contradiction in that, you know, that incorporate things that can Contribute yeah. to our overall objective. Yeah, the, but the, the discourse somehow in India is uh, in this way, but rather in the West, it, they are now started using the words like holistic medicine, uh, personalized medicine, but it seems it will take a long time for us to get adopted. After all, everything what they, we are always 20 years behind or something like that. No, no, but adopting. what we need to observe is that uh, the West was dynamic enough and smart enough to pick up and incorporate things from various other parts of the world into their scheme of medicine. They picked up uh, drugs for malaria from other parts of the world. They picked up the Indian approach to plastic surgery, rhinoplasty, improved it, strengthened it with anesthetics, and they have incorporated in their scheme of things. The West has not had any aversion to pick up and learning things from the rest of the world like a functional Indian society also did not have any. Anyway. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I may, Ramadan, if I can ask one last question. Uh, can I request you because I see Professor Jamal also waiting for a question. Okay. Let him ask okay. and then we can, if, you, if there is yeah, time. Yeah, if there is time. Yeah, Professor then Jamal, I, I see you are unmuted. You can please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Dr. <coughs> 
थैंक यू सो मच प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर बाला सुब्रमण्यम सर वेरी इंफॉर्मेटिव इलिस्ट्रेटिव लेक्चर्स एंड मेनी ऑफ अस नो मेनी थिंग्स वी आर सीइंग अराउंड अस बिकॉज मेनी ऑफ अस बिलोंग टू विलेज बैकग्राउंड so many uh, primary treatment what you uh, call it paramparik chikitsa traditional uh, medicines is already there but uh, the way you have presented the thing is it is attracted that yes there is a need to document it properly and there is a relation there is a relation okay modification improvement is there Uh, uh, i also see the religious thing in, in a different way paras paras stone is a, okay it may be uh, uh, something else touching stone but uh, it give a reason that yes uh, a material can be changes into another material and that given the material science when you talk about the um, uh, lord this uh, ganesha Uh, the elephant uh, head is there so it means a reason was there yes it is possible to transform to parts of one body to another body now the people are talking about transplantation of animal uh, kidneys and hearts can be transplanted to the animal so uh, i am really thankful to you sir you have supported my views and i want to hear some comment from on this topic also how the religion uh, which is documented all these thing very nicely uh, totally rejected by the science in the beginning and the many people of the world many countries of the world had taken that spirit they taken that vision mission thinking and develop like anything when you talk about uh, aeroplane when you talk about uh, surgery or plantation transplantation everything you see we have not developed but many countries have developed and taken the credit thank you so much sir please throw some light on it what is your views you know with respect to some of these uh, what if i'd say broadly if i talk about role of uh, religion in a sense there are values and value systems that come from religion science and technology in every part of the world has in some sense imbibe certain of these values sometimes it is explicitly said and sometimes it is implicitly so for example when uh, newton talked in principia when he talked about what is the nature of space and time and he laid out the concept of time that he gave as linear time is really a judeo christian concept of time almost all other <clears throat> societies in the world have a concept of time that is cyclic so how did newton come up with the concept of time that is linear it's a judeo christian concept of time so there are lots of concepts drawn from religion that are also suffusing science having said that i would say that uh, if you are to make some claims with respect to technology we have to take a hard look for example from the fact that there are representation of ganesha which shows a uh, elephant's body with the human head or a uh, <clears throat> parts of two different animals mixed together we need not immediately conclude that that was there as a technological possibility or a medical possibility that is existing and thus we take a rigorous look at it and examine it there are things like that we have taken a rigorous look at for example vigorous documentation shows that rhinoplasty or certain kinds of plastic surgery procedures were known even in pre british india vaccination and smallpox by a system called tika was an existent some of these other things we should look at it carefully and be modest about our claims i'm just saying this because sometimes we make claims that are not substantiated by hard facts it holds you up to ridicule and people reject the whole thing in fact it becomes a case of overstating the case you know for example i do not think that anybody has produced rigorous evidence to show that we had the capacity several centuries back to construct or fly aircrafts in the modern sense such claims have been made but i have not found any rigorous evidence so we should also be modest in making claims unless it is backed by rigorous evidence you know that's it. that's all
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Jamal. Um, are there anybody else? If there are no, then Pavan, just one question and we will wind up. Yeah, thank you, Ramnathan. Uh, so this is regarding the uh, uh, Vriksha Ayurveda that you mentioned about. And that is uh, part of it is about preserving the seeds and also nurturing the uh, nurturing the plants, etc. So uh, there is uh, that uh, the one of the foremost Indian activists on, on this environment uh, is uh, Shiva uh, Shiva Nanda. I forgot her name. Vandana Shiva. Vandana Shiva. Yeah, sorry, Vandana Shiva. So she uh, she started a uh, uh, something called a, a seed university, so to say, where they are collecting samples of all the seeds uh, that are native to this land. Uh, Pavan, and, Pavan. Yes. So Bala Subramanian collaborates very healthily with Vandana Shiva. So don't have to give an introduction. Come to a question directly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when when they are so they are, I mean in in my so my understanding of this enterprise is that they are trying to preserve the seeds of uh, uh, that are native to India while before being taken over by or maybe somehow hijacked by uh, some external forces. So how do you see uh, how do you see this in uh, in the context of like trying to uh, bring Indian knowledge systems to uh, uh, I mean to give it a modern context so to say although we don't need to use the word modern it's actually relevant like for example I see that nowadays it's all American corn that I see in the streets being sold I used to I, I can remember I remember the flavor that of the corn mucky that I used to eat in in my childhood that is no longer available and even the many of the uh, uh, what is it called uh, rice variety also are all gone so in that sense they are sequencing the dna making a patent uh, so in this sense what is the future of the traditional knowledge systems if there are such powerful external agents trying to hijack the uh, nature nature uh, as all, altogether of it that is native to india i'm sorry it was a long question i was not sure how to put it uh, yeah, no, i feel is. with respect to traditional knowledge and its use in my opinion the great tragedy is not so much that someone else is trying to steal it away. The great tragedy is that we ourselves are hardly making use of it. Take, for example, something like this turmeric. A few years back, there was a big hala in the press saying that uh, turmeric, uh, somebody is trying to patent it. It has wound healing properties. And then CSAR took them to court and made sure that it's not patented, protected turmeric, uh, protected neem and all that. Now, my basic question is at a different level. Sushrit Samhita and Charka Samhita, their texts that are at least, you know, for at least 30 centuries, Indians have known that turmeric has wound healing properties. Yeah. Now, today we are very disturbed that someone else is trying to commercialize it. But the basic question we have to ask ourselves is, if 30 centuries back we had knowledge that turmeric and such herbs have wound healing properties, Today, we must be one of the world leaders in wound healing and uh, wound healing technologies and medical technologies. We are nowhere in the picture. We are doing nothing with it. Yes. So the great tragedy of traditional knowledge is not so much that someone else is stealing and taking it away, but we ourselves are paying very little attention and not using it. In fact, there is one uh, my dear friend with whom we had a discussion who had this hilarious analogy. Sometimes you see there are Hindi movies in which there is a huge treasure that is buried. Huge box mm. with diamond, gold and all that. And then there is a snake that is guarding it. Anybody who comes near that, the snake will uh, hiss and uh, kill that person or drive it away. But what is the snake doing with it? It's doing nothing. Nothing. Right. So we are in the position of that snake, we are guarding it. We may be very happy that we have stopped A, B and C from using it. But the tragedy is we are doing nothing with it. The moment we wake up and start doing something with it, uh, that will be the most welcome thing. I'm not saying that we should uh, let allow people to do patenting and all that because about 50, 60 years back, India had the world with leadership in terms of Neem. And hardly anyone else in the world knew anything about Neem. But today the World Neem Conference is being edited and coordinated by a German scholar, very rightly, because 50, 60 years back, they had done a lot of work on it. So let's wake up and start using our own knowledge of which uh, ensuring that someone else doesn't steal it away is a, is a part of it. But we are obsessed with that. I would think that Indian scientists should do something with name and do something with uh, 
termination and not just say that you stop someone from misusing it let's start using it sorry yeah. that's the way. yeah i think it relates to your earlier statement that uh, yeah i mean when somebody uh, makes an observation then indians are very uh, 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 we are in the front line to claim that that something is we had superior knowledge from the ancient times uh, but rather they don't actually do the verifications i mean let us call it alternate may not be modern may not appeal or may, may not be to your taste but an alternative way of time tested one in the recent uh, centuries so they don't do it but whenever somebody does it like for example the like drink water from uh, copper uh, uh, copper tumbler uh, after the night or recently there was this nobel prize for uh, uh, doing uh, on uh, t cells when you do a fasting for 11 days or something like uh, on for every 11 days or 40 days so there were a lot of claims so i think it ties up with that statement also if i am uh, correct I mean, it's just a comment, not a question. Uh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Doctor Balasubraman. For your uh, inroads, if I may add, uh, Professor Balasubraman has been modest enough not to tell about his work, but since you raised the question of rice, I recently had the pleasure of uh, going through the work that CIKS has done, and oh. uh, it is mind blowing to see that they have revived kind of three hundred plus varieties of traditional rice. Mm-hmm. and it is like a good case study for all of us to see not just working in the laboratory but he has also uh, made i mean viable commercial plans as well so much so that there is a website and farmers are kind of equipped uh, to manage it so it's like a self sustaining thing so for me i mean i can share it with you later when we meet but this is like a eye opening thing about talking about specifically mm-hmm. about the rice part so oh. that is something which uh, we out of modesty he didn't disclose so i have to Say it on his behalf. And uh, talking about this turmeric, sir, give the example a few years back. Last week or ten days back, in Tamil we call it manathakali kai. It is not much used in Andhra or Kar- Karnataka. Although in Banaras also it grows, but people don't consume it. Recently there has been a patent on that. And oh. again there is a huge halabula in the media saying we have been using it for ages and uh, uh, we have why the patent is to be given to them. So this is an on- ongoing saga. but at the same time i wish also to add this opinion this is my personal opinion that we have been time and again only told that we are good for nothing because we have been attacked so many times you did not stand up for yourself you are do not have a good self esteem you are not good enough to produce any valid knowledge so time and again being bombarded with this kind of negative traits in your own talk sir you give an example that icar had produced eight volumes but you had to file an rti to get get your hands on it that's right yeah. so when the knowledge is kind of uh, these people are acting like the snake then uh, the same analogy can be used for the icar people who are who are guarding the volumes despite publishing it from the taxpayers money so there are problems of multiple dimensions um with that i mean i we come to a close of this lecture with the hope that we will have a continued interaction we would get an opportunity to invite you physically here to uh, varanasi and talk to us perhaps on your success story of reviving the 300 plus varieties of rice we would like to uh, we will be honored to listen, host you and listen to you and i thank you once again for spending your time sparing your time with us and all my uh, dear participants uh, who for their patient listening this is perhaps the last talk of this semester we may not have any talk in the december we will come back in january with a uh, with a new speaker and a new topic Thank you once again to one and all.